Um, and Norwegian Police and Customs, to some degree, are guided by cooperation with international police and customs. For example, Norway took part in uh, what was called Operation Tram in February 2010. In February 2010, <laughs> a joint operation involving police, customs, and other specialized units in a number of countries, which was directed at situs protected species used in Asian medicine. However, participation in Operation Ramp, directed at the illegal trade and trafficking in reptiles and amphibians, which took place in September and October 2010, in which 51 countries in five continents took, uh, took part, was not prioritized in Norway. And this may seem like, like the wrong decision. As uh, estimates indicate that there are at least 100,000 illegal reptiles in Norway. I've gone through seven verdicts for CITES cases, and these seven are all those eco crime were able to detect at a given moment. But these are unlikely the total number of CITES cases. Three of the verdicts concerned the same case, from the first instance court forderetten to courts of appeal, lagmannsretten, and høyesterett, the Supreme Court. And, um, and what you see here is this case. Uh, he had taken, uh, he, was he had sent this box uh, containing um, 271 artifacts with feathers from at least 20 sites listed parrots, two ocelots, and at least one boa constrictor. And he got, oh, it's CC in Norwegian here. He got 50, 45 days of suspended prison and no fine. And uh, even then, uh, the judge said that we had to be, have to be very strict in these cases so that others should be deterred from committing equal crimes. Um, and then we have another case um, where two, two cases ended with a fine only and therefore provide little information about the cases, but one of them concerns the smuggling of a large number of diamond sturgeon, sterlet sturgeon, and Siberian sturgeon, which are situs listed species, as individuals are killed for the production of caviar. Uh, this illegal act connects Norway to a harmful global market, and in this case, the offender got only a fine of 10,000 Norwegian kroners and 12,000 Norwegian kroner confiscations of the, of the financial gains of the crime in favor of the state. Uh, the, and uh, there's another case of particular interest in which a man was convicted to prison in 120 days in addition to confiscation of economical gains of the crime of 34,000 Norwegian kroner and the prohibition of being in possession of non-Norwegian species for five years. The offender was convicted for in 1998 on 11 occasions being guilty of smuggling 31 birds listed in CITES II, predominantly parrots, eight macaws from CITES-1, two boas, CITES-listed also, and 50 terrapins, in addition to a number of other animals and birds in order to sell them in Norway. The accused said in court that he had made such trips more than 20 times to buy birds in Sweden and the Netherlands. But these were confiscations done in 2011 on the Norwegian-Swedish border in Sweden, and the, the birds here are African greys. Uh, and this man he had reptiles in, in these little bags on his body. And my data indicate that uh, the, the man who smuggled, who, who was convicted to 120 days in prison, is likely the same man who smuggled this uh, African greys into the Norwegian Swedish border. He had, he had in conversation with uh, my uh, interviewee, he said that he had no plan of stopping the smuggling of animals into Norway because it's so lucrative. Uh, and um, in my interview, insiders also said that there's very high prob probability that these African greys are wild caught and taken into Netherlands because, the, because of the price that was very low. Wild caught birds are far cheaper than, uh, than hand bred, but those bred in captivity. Uh, so there are, um, yeah. Other, other typical cases confiscation reports reveal are person who smuggle reptiles for their own use as pets, as uh, buying a terrapin on the market in Turkey and put it in, in the luggage, or tourists carrying parts of uh, dead animals transformed into belts and other souvenirs, or simply heads and pelts, crocodile heads, bear and wolf pelts. 
And in examining post packages, customs have found products in which animals are ingredients, such as patches containing uh, leopard and tiger bone and musk. And uh, in a random control, uh, customs revealed the primate head, uh, and the suspect woman said that this was a test, and she wanted to see how much she could get for the primates, primate head in, in Norway. Uh, despite the fact that uh, all uh, primates are cited as one listed, which means they are, but it, it's banned from trade. So in my in my interviewees who who, who keep reptiles, uh, Norway is together with Iceland the only countries where reptiles are forbidden. So uh, and my interviewees said they often smuggle these animals to Norway themselves, and the reptiles are bought in reptile fair markets. The Terradistica Fair in Hamm in Germany is uh, notorious for its exposure of wild caught animals and is often mentioned. Or they buy them in zoo shops in Denmark or Sweden. And one should assume that uh, animals bought in these uh, zoo shops would um, be locally bred. Yet my interviewees said that um, they were likely wild caught and they, they um, assessed this because they could see that the reptiles were, had uh, parasites which wild caught uh, animals will have, but locally bred will not have. So, and, and they were aware that uh, it was illegal to keep reptiles. But these interviews touch traditional criminological topics related to stigmatization, social exclusion, and criminalization as well. Because um, the reptile keepers experience a situation in which they, as a consequence of hiding their illegal animals, often exclude themselves socially from people who do not keep these kinds of animals, and um, you do, do not share their situation. And as a result, socialize all the time more with other reptile keepers and exclude themselves from, from being socially together with other people because it is illegal, to, they, because they're doing something illegal in having this um, terrorism. And so they have now the Norwegian Reptile Interest Group argues for legalizing reptiles in Norway and has developed a positive list of 31 reptile species that can be physically handled. Uh, and a risk analysis is ordered from the Scientific Committee for Food Safety to assess the risk of bad animal welfare and uh, infections. So, uh, but if, if that should happen, that, uh, that um, that reptiles will be legalized in, in Norway, we may, we may face the same problems in seeing parallel illicit and illicit markets. How much time do I have? Okay. Uh, so this uh, unique situation Norway is in with having with uh, uh, illegalizing reptiles together with Iceland uh, also makes Norway an interesting case for the discussion of implications uh, regarding parallel markets and, re and regulation of trade rather than criminalization. No, that was not well. It can't be there. Uh, traffickers in endangered species can declare their products to be from different species. Uh, especially where there are a number of species of similar appearance. They can also claim that illegally caught animals have been bred in captivity. Uh, those sites may have contributed to reduce deaths and spe species extinction. After the implementation of sites, it is also documented that regulation entails significant problems in terms of verification of import and export certificates and in the skills in separating genuine from forged certificates. Consequently, with the existence of parallel licit and illicit markets, individuals which should be protected under CITES may be laundered, and neither buyer nor control agencies may be aware that the wild caught illegal individual is victim of abduction, trafficking, and trade. Corruption is another problem, which also points to the large difficulties in many states, as was mentioned here earlier today, uh, and both the will and capacity to effectively, to effectively enforce CITES. This also according to my interviewee in CITES. He estimated that at least half of the 175 parties to CITES do not efficiently enforce the re regulation and prosecute offenders. And one reason is political instability. And legal trade may encourage illegal trade. Uh, and it is rightly regarded as both difficult to control and more likely to lead to unsustainable harvesting at the legal harvesting, and there are plenty of examples where legal trade has flourished under the cover of legal trade, this according to Hutton and Webb. Still, in taking the offender perspective in the reptile case of Norway, one may question whether reptile keepers should be criminalized any more than parrot keepers. 
However, one evil should not be added to another because of the presumed legitimacy of the first, also for other reasons. From the animal's perspective, other animal suffering does not ameliorate their own suffering. Legalizing the reptile market in Norway will likely produce an increase in the practice of keeping reptiles and consequently an increase in the trade. It will challenge customs offices in separating the legal from the endangered sites listed ones, a problem which was highlighted in the interviews with customs. Although it is possible that locally bred individuals from Norway and Denmark may cover much of the demand, illegalization of the Norwegian market can also entail an increase in the trafficking and trade of protected species. So I'll stop there and I do not have the time to discuss species justice and individual justice here. I have a question about species justice which you can get to. I think with all three papers one of the things that emerges is that um, you know, the lack of political will uh, and often uh, unless there are compelling arguments about loss of local economy or, or violence or corrupting officials, then there's sort of very small steps forward in eradicating these sorts of uh, crimes and harms. And it strikes me that the, one of the fundamental issues is the human-animal interaction. Mm. And, and, and this is the species justice argument, that until we cease seeing animals as objects of trade, recreation and food, mm. until we move on from that and yep. see them as something then they're always going to be seen as legitimate targets yep. for exploitation and yep. abuse. Um, and I'm rather hopeful in a sense, sort of being in the environmental law, that I see a lot of development taking place in animal law. I think it's going to be one of the fastest growing areas in the next 25 years of international law. But for me, and this is a question, to what extent do we really need to, to address our relationship with animals mm. you know, in a broader sense? Mm. talking about it. I mean, you know, to, to dehorn, for a government to dehorn an animal as, as a crime prevention technique, and so you, you know, to, to protect it, you abuse it, and then you see that photograph you raised at the end, where it's standing up against another beast, another creature with its horns, and obviously there are, you know, social and cultural mm. aspects of its living that are now decimated by, by government. So, you know, wherein does there lie an ideological shift of a, of a significant can I answer but maybe for myself and you can answer for yourself later on I, I think it's a uh, I think it's been interesting when I'm reading the, the criminal criminology literature on the wildlife trade which I think where people take different stands uh, some uh, all the time talk about the, 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 it as poaching when animals are taken from their habitats uh, I prefer the terms abduction because I think that that is what happening and, and uh, I, I, I do not accept, I, I knew, do know that the CITES Convention um, may have helped stop the ex many species from going extinct, but I still am uh, very critical to the rationale in the CITES Convention because it legitimizes the, the trade in, in uh, other animals. It's also, you know, the concepts of harvesting, concepts of poaching, which imply that, uh, that the, the animals or animals in the wild are property of states or someone. Someone has the right to do to, to, to do what they will with them. I, I do not accept that uh, rationale. So, but I know I, I see in the literature that people have different viewpoints on this, and some uh, I think. But but this this might also have to do with the development I think of green criminology, where it's more um, uh, accepted that you that you can have this viewpoint. And you don't have to fight all the time to, to bring these questions into to the traditional criminology so much as before, I think. And, 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 and I'm grateful to all those who have, who have done a job in this, like, uh, like Pierce, Bern, for, for example, and, and, and Rob and Nigel, you know, yeah.